one. Church. Come on, we can do it better than that. Church. Tell your parents we're going to church on Sunday. That's what we're going to do. Let's pray, you guys. Hey, God, we thank you, Lord, that you are good. In the midst of chaos, in the midst of a nation that is pulled all over the place as people cry out and ask for answers, God, there's only you. In the lives and homes of those represented here, we need you, Jesus. We need more of you. We need more of your presence. Even as we finish praying and Miguel just says we'll talk to you later, we thank you, God, that we have access to you and your throne, that whatever burden or weight we carry, you are listening, you are eager, you are alive. And God, I pray right now for the next few moments as we open up your word, you speak and minister to your people. In Jesus' name we pray and say, amen. Awesome, you guys. I'm blessed to be back with you. I have been driving all over the place in this area for the last two or three days with my family. There's a lot of farms. There's a lot of cats. There's a lot of crazy things flying around in the air. This is an interesting place to live. We love it. But I do want to just jump right into the text today because what I want to talk to you about is the struggles we face within ourselves the first day was about Jesus. Who is he? Do we know him? Is our faith in him? Yesterday was about the external, the things that are going to influence you. And I had many good conversations outside where people said, you know, I love sports. It's everything to me. And I realized I have to put it on the altar and say, God, use it. And you should use it. You should use whatever gifts you have as far reach as they can go as anyone else in the regular world because you serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. And while we have these outward influences, I have to say today, is it also possible there's also things already inside of us from your childhood, from your experience, that isn't just this outward influence, but it's happened to you and it's something you carry. Because for me, as I told you the story, I came to faith at 24. I came to faith with a friend of mine. We'd watch The Passion of the Christ. We'd search for God. This guy's 6'3", 240, head to toe, tattoos. He's OD'd numerous times. One of my best friends. I loved the guy. But some years ago, walking along in his faith, he suddenly began to struggle. He fell back into an addictive habit that, that caused him to have to go and get through a whole system again. His wife fell into certain situations. And so as I was sitting there with the Lord, God, what is it that happens how is it we can run so well with Jesus for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and then suddenly something happens, and in that season of God, why does this happen to your people? Why are some people one day down the front saying, Jesus, you're all I need, and why the next can they be out there in the world giving themselves over? And this verse just kept coming to my mind out of Hebrews 12 that says, let us lay aside the weight, lay aside the weight, lay aside the weight, and what did that mean? I never really studied this verse before, but I can tell you this. One of the things we don't need in our life is weight, right? Weight in our school, weight in our family, weight in the things we try to do. I mean, just being a human being, we carry this weight of the struggles of life. And for me, in this season, God was about to unpack a bunch of things. And I want to just read for you this verse out of Hebrews 12 and 1 and 2. We should have it on the screen, but... I'm going to read the same translation you guys normally have, but here's what the author is saying to us. He says, Therefore, church, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, that means people who have gone before, the Abrahams, the Moses, the Jacobs, the Rahabs, because of these people and the way they've lived, what should we do? He says, well, Because we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race set before us looking unto Jesus. He tells us in Hebrews 11 this whole hall of fame of these great men and women of faith and whether they're looking down upon us today and we can consider them and their faith or whether we just have their examples in the Bible and we'll see them face to face one day, God tells me, and tells my friend I was sharing about, and tells you, let's consider those, the patriarchs of the faith, the other believers, God bless you. Let us consider them and lay aside the weight. But it's amazing in this verse, he says, lay aside the weight and the sin. What do we always hear being preached? Sin. Go and sin no more. The wages of sin is death. Why does he separate weight and sin? Don't sin. How many of you guys know if you sin, there's going to be consequences, right? 
You tell lies, it isn't going to be good. You rob a bank, you're going to go to prison. You punch someone in the face, you might get punched back. Do not do that. Amen? Especially on school property. Amen? But the idea is this. What do you mean lay aside the weight and the sin? I've already fled from the sin. I wrestle with sin every day. Guys, for the rest of your life, your body is wretched. It wants to sin. I'm going to fight off that sin and trust in Jesus. But what does it mean to lay aside the weight? And the word weight, if you know the way the Bible's written, it's a Greek word. And it's this word, okos, and here's what it means. Lay aside the mass, the bulk, the prominence, Lay aside whatever is the burden and weight that you carry. So I could just say this. What are you guys thinking about? What is going on in your life right now? What has been going on in your life? I said to you, bring up some crazy things that happened to you. What is that mass? What is that bulk? What is that weight? If I said to you, what is going on right now with what you're thinking for the future? What is continually in your mind? What may even be sitting there right now? What someone said to you or did to you or that you believe about yourself that isn't in God's word? Because I didn't know yet what God meant when he says, lay aside the weight. I'll tell you this though, that as a skateboarder who traveled in the world since I was about 13 years of age, I don't like weight. I would travel all over the world with these skateboard companies and you show up to the airport, you get to the hotel, you go skate, you want to film tricks and videos, you want to have a really good video part, but there's always someone on the trip that shows up who has 15 bags to the airport, so they're always there late. They have every kind of skateboard, every kind of trucks and wheels and DVDs and clothes and I mean the kitchen sink and their cat, amen? These guys bring everything they can and they get to Barcelona or Japan or Australia and they're dragging their bags around, they're last off the plane, last of the hotel, and you never get to do anything because of the weight they're carrying. And not only is the weight slowing them down, but it will slow down other people and that's simply an example to say in the spiritual, you and I today have been told by God we need to lay aside the weight. How do we know this is factual and biblical? Because in that verse we just read, it says, lay aside the weight and the sin. But Paul also says, because there is a race set before us. I'm going to talk about this more tomorrow, but there is a race set before Brian. When I came to faith, my faith was activated. And Jesus at the starting line, and he pulls the gun and says, go. And I continue to run the race now. And Jesus is along the way, sharing water, speaking life into me, giving me direction. But I get to the end of life, and there he is at the finish line. I'm running this race. We know this because listen to these two verses that Paul says. He says, don't you know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. He writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.5 and says, if anyone competes in athletics... He is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. So God, what are the rules for this Christianity? They're not rules in the same sense of the Old Testament, but they're rules like this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor. Be filled with the Spirit. Go into all the world. And what did he just say? Lay aside the weight. I was going to God saying, why are my friends all over the place? And I'll tell you, I was about to find out why this verse is so important. Like I said... I'd worked hard my whole life. I'd made money. Life was all about me. I was divorced, suicidal, found Jesus, remarried, had more children. Thank you, God. But about five or six years ago, there was a massive weight that showed up in my life. My family is still back in England. And I get a phone call one day. Hey, Brian, mom's getting sick. You might want to consider flying home. So within a few weeks, I'd got tickets. My son and I flew back to England. They didn't really tell me what was going on and coming into your home. Here's your seeing your sisters and your dad and your mom who speaks more than me, if you can believe that. Amen? English people have run on sentences. That's the way it works. But going into Liverpool, seeing my mother with no hair, fully just cancer throughout her body, her eyes starting to move all over her face. I mean, she smoked her whole life. They just had this crazy lifestyle. I mean, but they loved us and took care of us. And there I am looking at my mother, seeing a totally different human being. How many guys know this feels like a lot of weight? But I'm a Christian. I'm going to open up to James 5. God, you're going to heal. You're going to deliver. My family doesn't believe yet. They've seen our divorce, seen how depressed I am. God, this is how you're going to heal my mother. So we came back home and Within a few months, Brian, you probably want to come home now because either you're going to come back for a funeral or you're going to come back and see your mother while she's still alive. My wife's parents are still alive to this day. 
People in my family hadn't really passed. My parents were only in their 60s. Flying back to Liverpool now and coming in the door at breaking my heart to show up in the room. I'd booked a flight for five days and getting there, entering the room, walking in the front room and there's just a bed and my mother's just laid out in it. Still no hair, can't even barely open her eyes. They're feeding her food. They're still allowing her to smoke cigarettes. And what broke my heart was looking at the bottom of the bed and seeing this whole wall of photos of all of my children. There's Dakota and Eden and Jude and my wife and I and realizing she's probably never going to see my kids again. She's probably never going to meet her, at the time as my wife's pregnant, her new child. Sitting there with my mother and what do you think I did? Sitting there. Sitting there thanking her, all the times you took me skating in the rain, all the things you did for me, how you love me and the example of hard work. But, but mom, I'll be honest, I can't do anything for you. I might pass the same way. I could die of cancer. I hope not. But whatever God's will happens to be in his will, what he allows. Sitting with her, sharing the gospel, hearing her confess Jesus as Lord. And I was only there for five days. And they said to her, what do you want? If you're going to pass, what do you want? I just want all my kids and my husband together. And all of us were together. Waking up one morning to my dad running out to the shop, coming back. We're all sitting in the room. And as he comes in, we leave for just a moment. The grandkids from my sisters kissing her on the cheek to go to school. And my dad comes out and says, I think she's gone. My mother passing away right before me. I prayed, I believe, what is going on? How many of you guys would say this is some weight, your mother passing away? It was heavy for me. Flying back home to my wife, who's now four or five months pregnant, so far along with our child, breaking my heart to tell my mother my wife is pregnant, only to just a few days in, getting a phone call from my wife once I'm still back, dealing with this verse, lay aside the weight to what? My wife calling me, unable to speak while I'm at an office, saying they think the child's passed. The baby that's inside here, she's four and a half months along, sonogram after sonogram, driving around with my hand on her stomach, kicking and all the rest of it, naming our daughter, passed. Still inside of her for two weeks, every time we're driving, my hand on her stomach, pulling my hand away. Craziest thing in my life. My mother passing was one thing, but now to see my wife go through this was crazy. How many of you guys think this is some weight? I'm a Christian, shouldn't life be easy? And I could get mad at God for that. I could say, you know what, God? Life didn't work out the way I think. And guys, sometimes it's a good thing when God doesn't lead your life the way you want. Amen? It's a good thing when God doesn't give you the prayers you want because you'd be a terrible situation if those things happened. And I'll get back to this story in a moment, but this is through our culture. We see this idea of weight in the world. We all know it. Remember that famous Christmas movie, Scrooge? You guys remember that? All the older folk definitely do the best version, but you guys remember the Jim Carrey version? The story of Scrooge, an old Englishman with a friend called Jacob Marley, who shows up on a Christmas Eve, and he begins to say, Scrooge. How's that for some English acting, amen? He's crying out Scrooge, and Scrooge doesn't believe it. He sees this spirit in his house, and he says, you're an old potato. You're a figment of my imagination. Scrooge doesn't believe it, but soon Jacob Marley begins to walk around with these chains. And these chains get his attention, and Scrooge says, what are these chains? And he says, these are the chains I forged in life. Meaning, Scrooge, the way we live our lives is things we can wrap around ourselves, is things we can say and do, the situations, whether we mean it or not, that can take hold of us. And he tells him, you should see the chains that you forged in this life. And we flash back to the story of Scrooge as a handsome young man. 1920. He has a girlfriend and he's dancing and he's skipping and he's enjoying life and things in his family go on. Things in his relationship go on. Jacob Marley passes away and now Scrooge is old and angry and hurt because of the weight and the things in life that are going on. Unfortunately for Scrooge, the movie ends where he gets right and he wakes up. He's able to turn from his ways. But I got to ask you, couldn't that have been me saying, God, you took my mother God, you allowed this to happen to my daughter and my wife. And God, I don't want to follow you anymore. I'm going to justify my sin and the way I'm going to live. And what does God say? Lay aside the weight. I'm sure most of you guys have seen the movie Forrest Gump. Are you familiar with that? Life is like a box of what? And I love chocolate. Amen. I believe heaven's going to be filled with all kinds of chocolate. I'm going to enjoy it there. Amen. But what is Forrest Gump really about? 
Take your eyes off Forrest for a moment, but think about Forrest's friend, his blonde friend, Jenny. There they are going through this whole situation. They're running through the woods one day, and Forrest hears this knocking noise. What's going on? Jenny's over there throwing rocks at what? Just some house in the woods. Why is she doing this? Is she working on her fastball, on her changeup? Is she focusing on joining the baseball team? No. Jenny is throwing rocks at this house in the middle of a forest that she's forgot about for years because of things that went on many, many years ago. And Forrest comes over to her and says this great line, sometimes there just aren't enough rocks. Meaning what someone said to you, what someone did to you, what you're carrying, there'll never be enough rocks to knock that house down. And something had happened to her. Something to do with her dad many years ago that she is still living in right now while he has gone on and she's never forgiven him. She's never let it go. She's still so focused on it. She hasn't been set free. And I have to ask myself, should I look in any way like Scrooge carrying a weight if I'm really a believer and who the son sets free is free indeed? Should I in any way carry the weight of what I've experienced? But I'll tell you, God, my mother just passed. I'll tell you, God, my wife just miscarried. Why does this happen? Don't I love you? Hasn't your blood covered me? Isn't everything good? Why would you allow that? And God has to remind me, you're living in a cursed world, and you should lay aside the weight. And Forrest says that. Sometimes, Jenny, there just aren't enough rocks. But you know what the Bible teaches? It tells us that we don't need many rocks, amen? We just need one. What is his name? Jesus. I didn't feel like that at the time. I was angry. I was hurt. But I have to ask you the question today. In your life, in your walk, forgetting me on the stage and the people around you, are you able to live out life as a Christian? Do you carry weight? Are there things in your life that you say, I know this isn't of God? And if I was to ask you, here's some examples. Can you really trust people? Can you trust people? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, love always trusts. I don't trust anyone that they're going to be perfect, but I trust everyone unto the Lord. Amen. You're going to let me down. I'm going to let you down. Can you live in a way that you can love people and trust them? Or are we so sheltered by the weight? Next one here is the F word. If I'm okay to say it, the F word. Why are you guys laughing? Can you forgive? Can you forgive? I'm not saying what they did was right. I'm not saying how it unfolded was the right way. But can you forgive? The Bible says in Colossians 3.13, bear with one another and forgive one another, even as Christ forgives. They pulled his beard out. They beat him up. They put him on a cross. Have I ever forgave anyone even close to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Can you love people? By all this, others will know that you're his disciples because you love one another. Can you have God do your least? I could go on and go on and go on. But if we say, I can't do any of those things, Lord, well, the Bible says with God, how many things are possible? All of them. I'm saying this because at such a young age, I want to get under your skin and say, listen, guys, if you don't deal with your baggage and your weight, you will deal with it other ways. You will carry these chains. You will throw rocks at Jenny the same way she lives it out in her life. She's in bed with everyone. She's cussing at everyone. She's angry at everyone. She's smashing everything because she never really deals with the rocks. And here's the things about our baggage and the weight that we carry. Is that how many of you guys know what's in my bag back at the hotel? No one. You know why? Because I'm the one that packed it. I'm the one that has my name upon it when I travel. I'm the one that knows everything that's inside of it. I'm the one that picks it up every day. And Satan wants to help us all unpack our baggage and justify why crazy things happened in an imperfect world. Why am I saying this? Because if we don't deal with our baggage and our weight, guys, it will constantly explode in our life. The Bible is filled with these stories. Do you remember in Genesis, who slew Abel? What's his name? Why did Cain do it? Yeah, it was jealousy, but that's weight, that's baggage. Think about the whole story today of the Muslims and the Jews. Why are there still wars? Because there's a weight and a baggage. King David and King Saul, you remember the story? They came riding into the city, and here comes King Saul, who's killed his thousands, and Saul is happy. Here comes David, who's killed his tens of thousands, and the Bible says Saul looked upon him with a jealous eye. There's some baggage. Baggage was in my life from growing up getting into so many fights and something would happen, we're just throwing blows. Baggage came into my marriage, punching holes in the walls, spitting at people, getting in fist fights with my wife's dad. 
That's a bunch of weight and baggage that I never dealt with. And there's this famous story out in one of the jungles, and this is how people actually catch monkeys there. It's crazy. They take a long container with a long neck, and they put a bunch of fruit in there that you've never heard of called bananas. Have you ever heard of them? Bananas, bananas. And they put these fruit, this, this banana in there, and you know what the monkeys do? They run over, and they stick their skinny little hand down the tube, and they grab it, and the guy comes out the bushes, and they won't let go of what they've got a hold of. They won't let go because they're so focused on what they're focused on that the guy can just hit them on the head and do whatever they do in that crazy nation, eat monkey brains or something. No, amen, amen. I don't get it, but this is actually how they do this. We can be so focused today on the things that have happened to us, and let me say this, it's justifiable. Life is crazy. There's things that happen to me that still today I can justify. But is that why Christ died? No. And with a couple of thoughts, and we've got about eight or so minutes left, but I want to read this verse to you and show you biblically just how dangerous it is. There's a verse in Luke 10, and I want you to picture this. Guys, some of you from talking to you, you're like, well, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. I was baptized, or I have a Bible. Or that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you and the living word of God saying, Lord, speak to me and show me. There's a story in Luke 10, and here's the idea. Jesus is coming to your house today. Let's picture today that Jesus is coming to your house and there's you and your brother or you and your sister. How are you going to be when you stand before the Lord? How am I going to be? And the story goes like this in Luke 10, 38. It says, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. It says, but Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. If you read this and it's just ink on a page, you're going to miss it. But Jesus, who is the Savior of the world, how many guys want to know what Jesus really looks like? Everyone's like, is he white? Is he black? Is he this? Is he that? I don't care what he looks like. I'm just thankful for his blood. Amen. We all need it. He is showing up to my house today, and he shows up to me, and if you're a girl, you and your sister, Mary and Martha, and he shows up to the home, and both of these women react a certain way, and what's inside of them reveals how they're reacting. It says, a woman named Martha welcomed Jesus into her house, so there he is. You can hear his tone. You can see his eyes. This is the Savior of the whale. He is the centerpiece of all creation, and look at how she reacts. She had a sister called Mary. And Mary sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. What did Mary do? She just sat with Jesus. She focused on Jesus. There was nothing getting in the way, but look what it says about Martha. It's even crazy that it says in the ESV translation, but Martha. Why wouldn't it just say Martha? God's trying to get us to see there was something going on with Martha. Brian had an issue. Scrooge had an issue. You are carrying something. It says, but Martha was distracted with what? Much serving. She was probably getting all the Bibles in place. She was probably playing worship. She was in here cleaning up and looking the most Christian and doing all these things. How do we know that? Because she actually says to Jesus, listen how crazy this is, guys. Jesus is in your house, and your sister goes up to Jesus and says this. She went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. How many of you guys know you never want to talk to Jesus like this? Don't you care, God, that my sister is doing this? Tell her what to do. How many of you guys know you never have to tell God what to do? Amen? Are we awake today? When you're telling God what to do, you have no understanding of who you're standing before. This woman is all over the place. She's missing the things of God. Yet Mary is sitting at her feet. And it says, and the Lord answered her. He says, Martha, Martha. How many guys know if God says your name once, you better be listening? Amen. There's three times in the Bible God repeats someone's name twice, and this is a spiritual smack around the head. It's as if you're in the road and the car's coming, and he yanks you out the way. And he's, listen, in the real language, it's a loving, caring Martha. Listen. It's Scrooge. Listen. Jenny. Listen. He says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Martha, you are all over the place. 
You are focused on the wrong things. The Savior of the world is before you, and you are missing him. You are carrying a weight. You are holding on the chains. You are unforgiving. There's something going on with you that you can't let go of. But you know what it says? It says, but Mary has chosen the one thing which will not be taken from her. The only difference in this story is Mary, when the Savior entered the room, she sat at his feet and said, yes, Lord. She said, my mother just passed. She said, my wife just lost our child, but I'm going to sit at your feet. But Martha didn't. Martha was running around everywhere. You know what God was showing me in this season? Is that we're following the Lord, but if I'm carrying this weight, I'm going to be all over the road. I'm going to be all over the place rather than looking under Jesus. Isn't it amazing that the verse I started with, with Hebrews 12, and it says, lay aside the weight, looking under Jesus. Mary was simply looking under Jesus. And you know what it says? That she chose to look under him. The Bible says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. But I can tell you this. I'll meet Christians who've been Christians for 30 years, and they love the Lord, but they haven't chose to lay aside the weight. They haven't chose to sit at his feet, and they're still carrying stuff. And as I was in this season, I said, God, you have to show me how to deal with this issue with my mom and my child. And you know what God showed me? My mother confessed Jesus as Lord at 67. And if she's in Christ, where did she go? Heaven. Amen. Amen. Can we say that? That's where she is. And you know my unborn child, where she got to go? So do you know who met my child before I did? My mother. My mother and my daughter in heaven together. I am missing it, but if I never laid aside the weight, I'd miss it all. My mother graduated this earth about five years ago, and my daughter missed out on half the whatever's going on in our lives that we don't need her to experience. But if I never laid aside the weight, I would miss it all. Why am I saying this? Because I want to say to you today, the things you don't let go of will shape the rest of your life. You'll have a backpack full of rocks that you throw at people for the rest of your days. It's not about your dad or your mom or what people have said to you. I get it. Or the things that happened to you. But I know that this verse to me was, Brian, let go of the weight. You know what I want to finish in praying for? Today that you would let go of some weight. That today, just because you don't understand what they did, we can pray and let go. Let's bow our heads for a moment, you guys. God, we thank you for your people. God, we thank you for even as silly as it sounds, these, these movies like Scrooge and Jenny, but God, for the rest of these children's lives, as they would see them, they'd say, what am I carrying? Why am I holding on to this? God, what other people say about us, what other people have done to us, and I get it. It can be so crazy. It can be the darkest of secrets. It can be things that we're still mad about, but God, it's only really you who are good. I pray today, God, as they've even heard this message, that they would hear your voice impressing upon their heart. Child, lay aside the weight. One thing is needed, and Mary chose it. She sat at your feet, and she pressed in. Even though Martha called you Lord, the curios, it is Mary who sat, and she received in God today. And even as an act of faith, church, just, just opening up your hands and just releasing here. God, I release what I'm carrying. I release whatever happened. I release what I'm going through. God, I'm laying aside the weight. I'm going to continue to pursue you. I'm forgiving and letting go because I know that you are good. And God, I pray for your people that you continue working on them. That the people who are here, the pastors, the teachers, the counselors, they would be used mightily to let go of even more weight in these children's lives. And God, we thank you for the cross, for the blood, that you're alive and well today. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome.